the thought of the unknown is challenging and, and it's confronting. So it's really a case of just trying to stay positive. If something didn't work the first time, understanding how it didn't work and where there might be improvements and how you can continue to push the envelope and, and provide a better rounded experience to the people who, who it is that you service. Hey everyone, welcome to Switch Hub TV. It's your host, Wei and John. Today on the show, we have Mr. John Natoli. John is an experienced clinical microbiologist who's gone on to be a product specialist and account manager servicing the clinical and food manufacturing industries. More recently, he's launched MEC Cleaning Validation, which was created to support organizations to better manage the risk of microbial infections within the workplace. John, welcome to the show. How are you? Welcome. Good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah, no worries. I, I guess we'll get started um, in the customary switch hub fashion. So what, what got you interested in science? Um, yeah, why did you get into the world of science? If you could just give us some background and context behind that. Yeah, look, I, I guess probably starting off at school, always sort of taking an interest in experiments and, and you know, did all the, the chemi chemistry and the physics. And um, really, I mean, I finished my... Uh, HSC and sort of didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I actually started off doing chiropractic uh, because I sort of felt like I wanted to work uh, with people in, in, in hospital environment and um, sort of got about halfway through when I realized that, um, yeah, maybe I, I would be better suited to something slightly different. And um, yeah, I, don't, <laughs> I was lucky enough that I, I landed a traineeship um, at Prince of Wales Hospital. Um, yes. And um, yeah, no, they said I, I, I fell into that role. I was lucky enough to get it a, a, across uh, probably about 80 applicants. And um, yeah, and, and uh, after that, I was hooked. Uh, so microbiology is, is a very um, hands on science compared to, you know, let's say clinical biochemistry, which has been very much automated over the years. But the, um, the part I liked about it was the understanding. Um, the biochemistry and, and the, um, the phylogenetics and the epidemiology and all those things and, and almost like putting a jigsaw puzzle together and sort of saying, okay, well, if it has this, it has this and has that, well, then it must be this organism as opposed to that organism. So yeah, definitely yeah. it was very interesting. And, I, and, I, and I've, um, you know, I've been in the field ever since. Yeah, and if we could just take a step back a bit. So you were saying initially you were um, working in you know, the field of being a chiro chiropractor um, that sort of didn't really gel with you. And then you got a traineeship through the Prince of Wales. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that was, I guess, I don't want to say easier, but you were able to transition to that since you had a bit of experience within hospitals or in that sort of setting? Yeah. So look, I, I guess in retrospect, I probably would have made more money, money as a chiropractor. But I guess the thing is that um, probably about second year into uni, I actually um, injured my hands playing basketball. And so I sort of thought, well, if these are going to be my my tools, um, well, I didn't want to put myself in a position where I set myself up for failure. So the idea was that I changed out of chiropractic and I and I went into science and uh, did uh, did double degree in biology and chemistry. Um, but I guess the thing is that look, I found it really hard landing a job. Um, I have to admit, um, but definitely my ability to get the traineeship that I, I was lucky enough to get um, definitely helped me a long way. Uh, yeah, so yeah. that, um, I don't even remember how I got the job actually. It was, yeah, I remember being very nervous at the time and um, just, you know, I mean, my degree, uh, whilst it had microbiology in it, it didn't have a clinical microbiology component like um, let's say U University of Sydney or, or UTS have. So um, really the odds were, were up against me, but I, I, I must have said something right because I was the lucky applicant. Yeah, uh, yeah. But um, yeah, no, as I said, so it, it was, I think maybe my attitude probably set me apart from others and my, my uh, willingness to learn and to try new things. Uh, definitely th those were, were things that um, have, always put me in, in good measure. And uh, yeah, look, I guess that they're difficult things to learn, but yeah, I think you've just got to believe in, in your ability and your brand 
and try to yep. say, well, this is who I am and this is what I can offer. Yeah, definitely. And I wish we could cover every little thing you did in your career, but that we'd be in, on this call for hours. Um, yeah. But I know that you um, eventually w went to work um, at Concord Hospital as a mm -hmm. clinical microbiologist for quite a substantial period of time. Um, could you just yeah, tell us what that was like, what, what work you did there? Because um, I mean, and I think it's increasingly important in the context of COVID, right? So, you know, shout out to all our frontline workers in terms of like nurses, doctor, doctors, um, all of those guys working on the front line. But um, I think people don't realize that a lot of the work um, also, you know, goes to the clinical microbiologists who are working in the hospitals mm -hmm. and the labs. So if you could um, give a bit of context and background as to what you did there, what you saw in your time there, what, what were the cool things you did and how that sort of um, ties in given what's going on with the world right now with COVID-19. Maybe you can tell us what's um, interesting about um, the fact that you have to uh, pretty much deal with this crisis, you know, in this current pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. So um, at the time that I started working at Concord Hospital, I was lucky enough that I had someone uh, who was very experienced, very knowledgeable, take me under his wing. Um, really appreciative of what I learned from him. And, you know, every chance I got, you know, even you know, during lunch breaks and sort of, you know, attending conferences and volunteering my time just so I could absorb as much information from him as possible. Um, I was lucky enough that I um, got involved with some, some publications. So definitely putting my, my name out there amongst others within the microbiology community. Um, it meant that I got to attend uh, conferences, which was a really good experience, get to, to read up on other people's um, you know, research projects and things like that, and things that we might be able to take back into the lab. But I guess taking more of a, a turn for, for COVID, I was actually part of the elite team at Concord Hospital that was responsible for developing and implementing the molecular techniques that are now used to identify bacteria and viruses, including COVID-19. So we set up the PCR lab that was non-existent Man. and we developed assays, um, originally looking at sort of resistance markers, uh, you know, trying to identify um, MRSA, which is golden staph, um, from uh, people who present with, um, with bacteremia. Um, and then the, the, the testing sort of just continued to manifest itself. Before we knew it, we were looking at, um, you know, screening enteric pathogens, so looking at, at um, bacterial causes for, for hospital-acquired diarrhea versus community-acquired diarrhea. Uh, you know, we started doing, um, you know, looking at, at 16 SPCR and a few other things that they, these techniques are probably a little outdated now, but at the time, very revolutionary in, in what they did and, and the information that we were able to provide the clinical team was essential to, to be able to provide the, the, the cutting edge and the high quality care that their patients would have expected when they come to hospital. So prior to that, microbiology had not evolved a huge amount. Uh, you know, the people still using uh, you know, petri dishes and, and biochemical tests, but this really meant that we could categorically give doctors information that was not only accurate, but actionable in a timely fashion. So this really helped the hospital to be the best version of itself it could be, but I guess it all came back down to patients. But definitely if I was still in the hospital, I would be very much in the trenches doing all of the COVID testing. Yeah, well, I mean, John, we've known each other for a while, but I had no idea that you had a hand in, I guess, setting up the PCR lab for a hospital like that as big as Concord Hospital. So what, what were the biggest challenges there? Because that just seems like a gargantuan task um, that I'm sort of just trying to wrap my head around. So, you know, what were the challenges then and how did you overcome them? Yeah, so look, definitely having the support was important. Um, as you can imagine, trying to uh, talk about new technology to people who are familiar with doing it the old way um, has challenges in itself, but it's really a case of just trying to explain and, and pre present a business case and, and, and a, a feasibility that if we continue to go down this path, well, this is the, the best that we can be is where we are right now. But 
knowing that microbiological cases were becoming increasingly more complex, being able to effectively anticipate when people were likely to have a resistant organism and what the antibiotic cascade may look like could be the difference between life and death in a lot of, a lot of places. So I guess, um, yeah, understanding the, the nature of, of what is a, a pathogen versus something that is part of the normal skin, skin flora was vastly important. And I guess it, it comes down to understanding what type of sample you were doing versus the type of organisms that you were able to cultivate. So I guess you would treat a, a blood culture uh, very much different to how you would treat a sputum, let's say. But I, I guess, look, it, it, it did have its challenges and we got there eventually. Uh, definitely there was a lot of investment and a lot of faith in it, acquiring the technology we needed to do that. But really it was a case of just trying to um, reassure the, the people who were making the decisions that indecision in this spot was actually going to cost lives and slow down uh, progress. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely here there. Um, so, you know, you, you, you were there for a good amount of time working in the trenches, like you said, you know, running those PCR screens, um, doing the nitty gritty, the dirty work. Um, and then you sort of, you just decided to transition into a, you know, product specialist role where you, you know, started to serve, I guess, I still within, I guess, the clinical diagnostic sort of industry, but from a product specialist slash account manager sort of role. So can you talk about that transition, you know, working in the lab for, you know, 10 plus years, you know, get, getting your hands dirty and then going to, and then transitioning to be the person um, on the other sort of front line, you know, putting out these products to, to, to clients. Um, to yeah, can you just talk about innovate. that transition there? What were the yeah, opportunities, absolutely. the challenges, and what was that like? Did you did you miss the lab? So, and how did you come yeah. to, to it? Yeah, so look, I, I guess... I'd, I'd worked there for about 10 years and, you know, at that point I was on the cusp of turning 30. I was looking at, at my stature within the laboratory and whilst I was respected amongst my peers in the greater microbiological community, I sort of felt like potentially there may not be the opportunities for me to move up within the limited hierarchy of the hospital because those responsibilities were for people from many years before I had started and inevitably because of cut costing uh, people would want to um, pass on those responsibilities as people retire but not necessarily give them the the, the title or the credentials or, or, or the money that comes with the extra responsibility so uh, I was actually in a position where one of the suppliers actually my old rep from Thermo Fisher um, approached me and said look we've got a a maternity leave role coming up and uh, that I had good product knowledge and I was uh, good at, at, uh, at communicating with, with people. And he said, look, you've got nothing to lose at this point. What do you say? And uh, yeah, really, I mean, I was, I was headhunted for the role and, you know, a conversation over coffee and I had the job. So, I mean, it was happening very, very quickly and, and not without its risks. In fact, I even had to take a small pay cut to do the job, but I wanted to prove to myself that this is something that I could do. But I guess the thing is that I knew that I had much more opportunity to better myself and to move up within a, a corporate system than I would um, having stayed at the hospital. Yeah. What, so what was your feeling? I mean, like, was it hard to transition or is it just because you just, it's something that you need to do? Now, what, what was yeah. your mindset back at the time? Uh, in a word, terrifying. So being microbiologists and, and I guess scientists as well, probably not huge fans of change. So for me to, to change into a, a, a whole new industry, even though it serviced the industry that I was very familiar with, uh, was risky. Right? And, and you know, there, were, there were times where I would think, geez, what have I done? <laughs> you know, should, should I have stayed in the lab where it was safe and I knew what I was doing? Uh, but, you know, I guess the thing is that I embraced the challenge that was um, transitioning and I felt that whilst I was in the, in the hospital, I was servicing the, the needs and expectations of the, um, of the patients that were there. 
but I felt that I could have a larger impact servicing, let's say, every hospital within New South Wales. Yeah, definitely. So, and, 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 and that was interesting for me. And do you think, John, that, because um, you, you mentioned it's, it was a contract role, and I think that's, mm -hmm. that's somewhat relevant. Maybe, do you think if it wasn't a contract role, you might not have taken the leap of faith because with a contract role, you can sort of just think, hey, you know what, maternity leave, if it doesn't work out past the nine, 12 months, you know what, I can just go back to what I was doing before. Um, and it's just no bridges burnt. Um, so did that like have play into your decision a little bit? Uh, yes and no. I mean, um, for, for all the reasons you mentioned, yes. I mean, th there was that um, that finite period of time where I could test myself and say that, okay, look, can I make this transition? Am I good enough to, to make the leap from, from laboratory into industry? And then the other part is that, well, what person, you know, of, of sound mind would leave a permanent full-time job to yeah. pursue something that only had a very short contract lifespan. So, so look, I guess the thing is that it, it, it was a decision that I made and the best decision I thought for myself, for my professional development and for my family. Um, and, and look, and I learned a lot of things in that job. Or, you know, I mean, I was, I was a customer, so I already knew their products. I, knew, I could talk about my firsthand experiences using those products with my customers, which were people who I already knew and respected and people who I would consider friends. So I think that if I had tried to transition from my, my role in the hospital into something like pharmaceuticals, I may have had a, a, a more challenging time making the transition. But I think definitely the, the customers that I had were very supportive uh, because of my previous relationships with them. Yeah, and, and I really like that you mentioned, like you had hands-on experience with the things that, you know, the diagnostic kits or the tools or the equipment that you were, um, you know, um, selling to clients or promoting to, to your clients. Can you tell us like how important it is for, you know, someone in that role to actually have done the hard yards in the trenches to actually know what they're talking about as opposed to being that typical sales guy that's trying to like shove a product know, down your throat. Yeah, that's right. So, so look, I mean, I, I, I guess one of the things you learn reasonably quick is that if you start lecturing to people, then, then for the most part, they will start to tune out reason. So it's, it's a case of trying to listen to, to what they're saying, listen to what they need. If they're having problems with the current, product, something they don't fully understand, it's something they think that could be improved, then your objection is to show that, that what you have fills that gap and the byproduct of that is selling. So I guess it, it's, it, it's something that I've always tried to be. I'm not particularly pushy when I talk with my customers, but you know, it, it's a case of trying to be more collaborative and more consulting and less, I've got one of these, how much do you want of it? Yeah, been there before. Yeah, so, um, so I guess the thing is, look, it, it's, it's it's sort of like a good joke. You've got to know your target audience, but knowing yeah. the intricacies of, of the products whilst in the lab, yeah, uh, yeah. because I wanted to know, not because someone said you need to know these things, and, and me just being a, a lab generalist for the most part meant that I could apply my knowledge in, in these products into the, the sales arena. Yeah. And then, um, you know, of course, I want to leave some time for you to talk about, you know, your startup, the thing that you're working on. So I just want to move rather quickly. But I do have a question before we get to that. You know, you, you following, you know, uh, working in the lab, you then worked a few years servicing the clinical sort of space um, and then transitioned into servicing the food industry, especially with key diagnostics. Um, can you talk about the differences between servicing, you know, the clinical space versus um, you know, the food manufacturing, manufacturing sort of space. Um, if you could just, you know, give a bit of insight there. Yeah, absolutely. So the, they are worlds apart in terms of hospitals require a whole heap of product registration and needs to be compliant by this method. It needs to be this sort of standard. And as long as your product ticks all those boxes, then people are generally happy to, to take it on board. But um, there are, some um, hurdles that need to be jumped over um, in terms of the, um, the structure of the hospital approval system. 
but uh, yeah, look, for the most part, it's something that that is, um, you know, it's all about talking about what it can do and and how does it do it. But when it came into me going from clinical into food, um, actually tell a lie, I was um, actually before I went into clinical, I had a little transition where I was servicing uh, the research in the universities. Right. And that was different again, because you're talking about people who needed cutting edge technology and had very limited budget. So it was about managing those expectations and trying to stretch their dollar further. But I remember at the time that I was working with a product that was a premium product in the market. So encouraging people to spend more on what they were already using uh, was challenging and, and, and really trying to value add and trying to say that, okay, well, you could be using this product, but how confident are you going to be in the result? And the literature that, that supports the argument that this product will give them a better quality result and that is worth investing in became the conversation. But I guess when it comes to talking to people in the food industry, it seems to be more what's the best way to say this <laughs> more like guidelines than rules compared to working mm. in clinical. So there's, there's very much a, a dogma that all product testing needs to go to a NADA credit laboratory, but there's not a huge amount of guidance for food manufacturers when it comes to doing environmental pathogen surveillance and, and, and hygiene and those sorts of things. So definitely encouraging people that, this is more being proactive rather than reactive and trying to band-aid issues as they arise and talk about efficiencies and talk about reducing wastage becomes the, the cornerstone of the language that I use to encourage food manufacturers that spending money on what they can't see is a good idea. Yeah. yeah. So with the products say for example um as a product specialist if a company has um developed or innovate a new product and you haven't tested it before how do you go about it if i may ask yeah so it's a good question so um from a clinical point you would you would need to have a conversation and start up probably something similar to a clinical trial where they would they would use your product using it um, in an arbitrary fashion comparing against a gold standard or a reference method. And then you would correlate the results and you would say, okay, well, how did the, how, what are the findings look like? And do, is there a correlation? Is there an improvement um, in, in time, in cost, in performance? So these are all, all attributes that need to be considered. So look, I, I guess, um, thankfully the products that I did um, for the companies that I sold for, uh, very well-respected companies, uh, you know, world leaders in, in their space. So there was a lot of the R&D part was, was done at the corporate headquarters, but really talking to people and giving them confidence that they're collaborating with, with a company that, that is well-respected in the community. Yeah, I just want to give you some time, John, to talk about MEC cleaning validation. Um, so you have the floor now, you know, this, I know this is your, your, your baby, your pride. So yeah. give us a spiel yeah. about MEC cleaning validation. So by coincidence, this all sort of kicked off just before COVID started, but so I guess that's, yeah, <laughs> that's what I wanted to ask as well. Was that a huge coincidence or was that just, it, it, it was, and, and, and look, maybe, um, had it happened three or four months earlier, would have probably been a little bit more organized, but, uh, yeah, look, it, it's been. It's been interesting, but I, I guess I, I've identified a gap in, in the market for people who want to be able to identify and, and articulate whether their business has been cleaned thoroughly enough. Um, and, and, I, and I provide consultancy and, and, and hygiene audits on that front. Um, I guess the cleaning industry for the most part seems to be very under-regulated and there seems to be a lot of people out there who call themselves cleaners, but not necessarily um, proud of doing a good job at cleaning. And you know, pre-COVID, you can make an argument and say, well, uh, as a victimless crime, it looked clean, but you know, if someone got influenza, if someone got gastroenteritis, um, you know, no harm, no foul. But now with the advent of COVID-19 
and there'll always be another virus and there'll always be another bug. But people are now demanding from their cleaning companies that they can show and they can prove that the job that they've spent tens of thousands of dollars on has actually been successful at managing this risk. And the problem is, like everything else in microbiology, if you could see it, you wouldn't need a test. But what I do is I shine light on the shadows that is germs and help businesses to make informed decisions about managing risk so they can get back to going back to work as close to normal as possible, but also about making sure that the people who have to work there can do their work safely. Um, and in the same way that if you had exposed wires or, or a puddle on the floor, it, it, it's an occupational health and safety risk. And in terms of the scope of the services you provide, is that more from, let's say, like an office cleaning perspective, or it goes all the way into like food manufacturing facility, pharmaceutical manufacturing facility? Yeah, so I don't, I don't discriminate. But look, I guess um, corporate offices, childcare centres, um, aged care um, would probably see value in what we have to talk about. Obviously, food manufacturers, uh, for the most part, should be adhering to something. Yeah. Um, called the HACCP program and making sure that you can um, show that you're working in a clean environment is a cornerstone of that program. So yeah. definitely, yeah. So there, if anyone who was interested in, in my services uh, are more than happy to, to have a look and, and, and make an assessment of their business, but it, it was more a case of just trying to uh, put as many feelers out there. And, and um, but look, I guess, Having your own business also means that, um, yeah, there, there's the extra stress and the burden of, of trying to make it all work um, in the same way of transitioning out of the lab in, into sales. You know, the, the, the thought of the unknown is challenging and, and it's confronting. So it's really a case of just trying to stay positive. If something didn't work the first time, understanding how it didn't work and where there might be improvements and how you can continue to push the envelope and, and provide a better rounded experience to the people who, who it is that you service. Right, awesome. Right. Now, John, if I'm, um, so essentially your newfound company, MEC Cleaning Validation, um, mm -hmm. what sort of things that you need um, to do in order to become a consultant? Because um, do you need accreditations to become a consultant? Uh, what is it like? Yeah, so that there's <laughs> very, very under-regulated, but look, I guess the thing is that if you can understand the, the uh, requirements for let's say a HACCP program and, and you have the tools and the resources and the documentation you can now go and substantiate that then then that basically makes you a consultant so really it, it's a case of just trying to to help to streamline and to simplify what is already a complex process unfortunately uh, there seems to be a lot of manual record keeping particularly in the food industry and as you're probably aware, that seems to be very prone to, um, to time wasting, but probably more so for transcription errors. So really doing a test, but then not having the records up to standard, it, it's like not having done the test at all. It doesn't mean yeah. anything. Yeah. And I guess the thing is being able to provide a result to people in a timely fashion gives them the opportunity to fix the problem before they have a big problem. Because once a product leaves your... Uh, your factory um, if the problem is is out there in your product well then you are on, on the the mercy of a product recall which is very stressful and very costly to a business not only um, in terms of the the dollars and cents that you've wasted making a product which is not fit for sale but the the larger ramifications of having uh, the damage to your brand which you've invested so heavily on so, um, say I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, if you were to talk to your younger self, what advice would you give to him? What advice would I give to my younger self? Um, you know, it's a good question. I don't, I don't normally live life with regrets, but I guess knowing what I know now, perhaps I may have made the plunge into sales a little earlier. Um, so I could be a little bit more astute of my craft and maybe would have moved up a little bit higher um, than where I am right now. Um, I guess you can make a similar argument for, for the business side of the fence that, you know, if, if I knew that I could, I could plan this 
six months earlier than I did, then maybe I'd be a lot more developed and a lot more, um, you know, business ready. But look, yeah, no, no obvious regret. But yeah, look, I, I guess probably the only thing I would say is that if I had to go and talk to, you know, my 20 year old self going for, for that job interview at Prince of Wales Hospital, I'd say, look, just just try your best, learn as much as you can, and and really just believe in yourself and know that that whatever you you are offering is is valuable. Yeah, yep, that's right. All right, cheers. All Thanks right. for your time, John. Thanks for your time. No worries. Thanks for having me, guys. We'll I'll leave you to it with with um with the switch hub.